how this works. You don't know what? <laughs> you are. <laughs> oh. Okay, good afternoon everyone to this uh, day zero um, event um, named How is life in the digital age treating us? Um, we are going to discuss opportunities and risks for people's well-being and this session is organized by the InSafe Network, which is the European Network of Safer Internet Centers. Uh, my name is Sabrina and I'm part of the InSafe coordination team. Um, as part of our work we're doing um, with the Safer Internet Centers, we are maintaining on behalf of the European Commission a portal which is called Better Internet for Kids, which is available at betterinternetforkids.eu. This portal is a central gateway providing news resources about latest online trends and issues of concern for citizens, but for most children and young people, parents and teachers. However, the work um, of the Better Internet for Kids portal would not be possible without the input and the hard work of our national safer internet centers who are raising awareness about these issues at national level and they also provide resources and supporting services such as helplines and hotlines. Um, and they also support on notice and takedown on harmful content and child sexual abuse material. During today's session, you will be able to um, learn more about the work of the Safer Internet Centers as I'm joined by Evangelia from the Greek Safer Internet Center, Deborah from the Maltese Safer Internet Center, and Sofia from the Portuguese Safer Internet Centers. All three of them will give a short presentation um, about um, their work, and afterwards we're going to have a small Q&A session with our Better Internet for Kids Youth Ambassadors, who are also with us on, uh, on stage, because obviously if we talk about Better Internet for Kids and young people, we do need to give them a platform as well and discuss with them and include them in our activities. So it's also my great pleasure to welcome Catherine from Germany, Maria from Greece, Joao from Portugal, and Paolo from Italy. And with any further ado, I'm giving over to Evangelia to present the work of the Greek Safer Internet Center. So thank you, Sabrina. Welcome. Um, today I'm going to talk about children's digital footprints, which is a major issue today. So let's start with uh, what are our digital, digital footprints. So it refers to one, one's unique set of traceable uh, digital activities or actions or contributions or communications that are, are uploaded online, of course. Either it's data that we upload or it's our metadata, how we do it, when we do it, where do we do it. So there are two kinds of digital footprints. There are active digital footprints, where the data and the metadata is collected with the owner's knowledge, of course, which is the, the legal. <laughs> and then there is a passive uh, digital footprint, which is data and metadata collected without the owner's knowledge. But what is the landscape when it comes to children? So what about children? 
Today, more data is collected for children than ever before. And this is due to the fact that sensors, microphones, cameras have become uh, miniaturized and affordable, of course, for everyone. There are growing amounts of information that are available in digital and networked form. Mobile connectivity has become more powerful and more widespread at even um, a decreasing age. So children in a very young age use uh, mobiles and so on. Artificial intelligence, machine learning and natural language processing have progressed considerably which enables the analysis of large uh, data, so big data, of uh, structured or even unstructured text. So uh, let's uh, see now what is uh, the landscape when children's, uh, about children's data is shared and collected online. So uh, children's data is shared and collected at home, outside home, and virtually everywhere while they're browsing. When we're talking about home, then we have connected baby cameras, we have connected toys, connected things, we have smart appliances like smart TVs, smart um, speakers, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we are browsing, of course, children are browsing on their own, so um, data and metadata are collecting while browsing. Parents are uh, on social media and they share stuff about their children. Children are on social media and they share stuff about themselves. And of course, uh, smartphones and tablets collect so many things and so many data uh, and they share it online. And when we talk about uh, outside home, then we have school data, public databases like schools, like medical records, like municipal personal records. We have a study uh, and behavior apps which um, parents use or children use. We have location tracking watches or we have uh, location tracking necklaces or you name it. We have location tracking devices that we put on our kids. We have uh, data shared with our travel, pa uh, travel passes, our children travel passes. Biomedical data from uh, a private uh, um, hospitals and public hospitals and loyalty cards that uh, maybe parents have and they share like date of birth or they share the gender of the children, due date, if they're pregnant, the mothers, so on and so forth. So uh, this way data for children is collected online but there are consequences to consider. Their digital footprints extend right from the moment of birth or even sometimes pre-birth pre -birth with uh, the um, ultrasounds parents share, and they grow exponentially throughout childhood. But the availability of this data might have consequences on their lives. Have we ever thought about uh, could this personal health data affect their ability to take private insurance when uh, they grow up? Or have we thought about uh, the consequences the, the personalized ads have when, while browsing, for better or for worse? These are open matters that we have to consider uh, when sharing data of our children. So there are short-term consequences for digital footprints for children. The first foremost is the obvious, the stranger danger. So somebody might harm our child. Then there is bullying. This is also a, a, a danger that children face. Identity theft, the normalization of surveillance of our children, and false sense of security for parents if they wear a watch, a GPS watch, and false sense of well-being from parents sometimes. And there are long-term consequences like profiling. Profiling can be used to make highly significant decision, decisions for our children. So profiling can be used to calculate preferences, so they already know our preferences, or to predict the behavior of our child, or to make decisions uh, decision-making implications like bank account or visa or uh, other kind of stuff. So 
These are very important things that we have to consider. Researchers underline the need to provide a framework for the use of connected toys and connected things because they present implications for trust, privacy and security and they, they also have implications for social evolution. And they mention the lack of clarity in many occasions on how data is used, shared, manipulated and stored and of course they want on the possible normalization of children's surveillance as culture and as social practice. The positive act, acts, of course, are these last years, the general data protection rule from the uh, European Union, which is a regulation uh, EU law, and the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of the USA, the COPA uh, law, which applies to the online collection of personal information. Uh, all this data that is shared, of course, forms the digital identity of our children, which is as important as our self-identity. So Deborah is going to talk more about the digital identity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so basically I would like to start a little bit of talking about uh, the, what we call a cyber psychology about first of all about the online disinhibition effect that the internet has created especially to young people um, this illusion of being safer online because there is this sense of anonymity so they don't feel that they are being um, supervised by by people that know them or by their parents this open playground that the children where the children are exposing themselves where they are constantly uploading pictures of themselves uploading other important information um, so to connect with what Evangelina was saying, it, the, even the fact that all this digital footprint that's been forming all these years, if I had to Google search or if I had to search someone with his name and surname, what information would I be getting? And this is this disinhibition effect that the internet creates. And all this escalates when we talk about online. So, um, if, I, if my behavior is being um, irrational, if I am uh, talking badly to someone, obviously the fact that it is online, it escalates because there is a larger audience, it stays much longer online, and I can also find other people who uh, congregate with me, who share my same feelings, my same, um, um, my same perspective. Okay, and if we had to take a look at how children are normally are, if we take the age between 4 to 12 bracket, they're obviously naturally curious, they want to explore things, but they're also mostly the population which is mostly vulnerable on the internet because they are not yet, they're technologically savvy, but they're not yet old enough to be uh, worry of the risks that are out there. So um, even if you had to ask a child uh, that age, for example, with whom are you sharing this information? They tell you, I'm just sharing it with my friends. They do not realize that they're sharing also the information with the application that they're using and also with the service provider. So they find difficulty in recognizing that, that risk. Um, if we had to take uh, a look at the nine-year-olds, the, the nine-year-old bracket when basically it's prepubescent, when the child is starting to develop, you get this, um, they need to develop a self-concept, they start obviously also forming their self-esteem and their self-worth and sometimes evaluating their self-worth in comparison to others. And with teenagers, um, this identity forming is then obviously more escalated on the internet because I need to get validation from my peers. So I crave feedback online. It obviously depends on the amount of risks, uh, on the amount of likes that I, I, I'm getting online, um, what others are expecting from me. So trying to um, uh, upload the best photo ever, edited with different uh, um, applications, etc. Um, uh, and if we had to take a, a look also at the 
physical, what is going on in the brain of the teenager, we find that the um, frontal part is the part which is still under construction. So it is the critical thinking, um, the self-control part, which is not yet formed, whereas the pre, um, sorry, the limbic system of the brain is obviously all formed. So you have this also also physical um, war going inside the brain, where um, uh, self-control versus uh, impulsivity, uh, risk-taking, irrational behavior, and if. In uh, the identity forming stage, we obviously know that uh, the need for attachment, the need to have to belong to a peer group, the importance of, for example, we're seeing it a lot of in young people, the FOMO um, uh, thing, the fear of missing out. Um, so the fact that, for example, I'm not part of a WhatsApp group that my friends are part of, or the fact that I'm without my online devices for some time, this may create some form of anxiety, because that would mean that my peer group, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, updated with what is going on with, with my peer group. So this, these groups that they're part of are also, um, 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 they need them for the attachment to belong, to belong to a particular peer group. And what goes on in, and this has been going on, obviously, even the offline, but there is the identity versus role confu confusion. I need to know who am I. And usually, I do get these affirmations from my peers, um, uh, from people I, from groups that I'm part of, etc. Okay. Part of this is part of, as we said, as is coming from the peers, but that would mean also being pressured by my peers to uh, stay longer online, to play a particular game for, for uh, more time. Also to upload certain photos of myself, exploring my sexual identity, finding people who share my own, my own desires, my own interests. And uh, um, uh, the uh, necessity of uh, seeking validation, seeking validation about um, what I am uploading, who am I? And uh, obviously, that is why this pursuit for likes, for uploading the best posts ever, so that I get as many likes. And that would mean that I am getting um, information about myself, about what I'm worth. I have some young people telling me if I upload a post of myself and this post doesn't get a thousand likes, that I would that would mean that it hasn't been liked. I'm not liked, so I would remove it. Also, curating the perfect images. We know that young people usually take 20 images of the same photo. And then they are there uh, constantly trying to perfect that image. And as I mentioned before, maybe using different type of filters to obviously to adjust that kind of that kind of image. And this need obviously to have the perfect image to get more more likes or more followers. And sometimes obviously, the thing is that we picture an image of ourselves which isn't really us. So there's the Facebook version of us or the Instagram version of us when in reality we'd be sitting on a sofa bored and not doing anything in particular, whereas our social life, our, our social media life would be um, a very cool version of, of, of ourselves. And this is a little bit the same with uh, the selective view of, of, of reality, trying to obviously picture the perfect, grabbing the perfect image. And where does this get dangerous, though? It does get dangerous because a lot of young people, they follow um, other Instagrammers, they follow other bloggers who are constantly, obviously, using um, social media to promote themselves, to to um, to create this perfect image of themselves, and for them they are important. However, it can get also risky because 
as with, for example, the ProAna websites, where obviously I have these websites who are constantly um, trying to uh, normalize um, anorexia or normalize uh, bulimia or other eating disorders. So I have these uh, young people who are following these um, uh, these Instagrammers, and at the same time, trying to create a perfect image of themselves, and um, uh, these people are then creating this this type of content of this, uh, this type of content online. So to conclude, basically, we all have an offline persona and an online persona, and I think. Uh, for young people, this is where there isn't much difference about what is offline and, and what is online. And uh, that is why we um, um, there are expectations. We are creating expectations for our young people, this constant need to be liked, etc. But also we need to put things into perspective, into reality. Um, uh, and... Uh, we all know that our cyber self is constantly under construction. So even when we sleep, we, there are people who are liking, who are um, uh, uh, liking our pictures, who are following us. So our cyber self is constantly um, under construction. And this can also, in young people, create this feeling of urgency, of continuous feedback. Um, um, and uh, um, uh, and this need to be constantly popular and relevant in the in the online world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so the the main point of my my presentation will focus on uh, digital inclusion and literacy and what we have uh, been doing at the national level uh, to increase it. No, okay. Can we have the presentation back? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I just uh, first I would uh, uh, give you a, a brief uh, virtual guided tour of uh, the Portuguese Safer Internet Center. So we are a consortium built both by public and uh, private organizations, which complement their work towards a more informed and conscious digital citizenship. Uh, needless to say that the organization have a core work and expertise uh, relevant in making the internet a safer place to be. Uh, although we mainly targeting children and young people in the last years, the project has been uh, uh, working with other publics like parents and carers, sen senior citizens, social excluded young adults, among others. Uh, our mission is to develop, no, it's not working, it, it doesn't matter, no. okay, <laughs> the next one, okay, thank you. Our mission is to, to develop a culture of conscious use of the internet, empowering citizens to make informed and conscient uh, choices and contributes to the fight against uh, bad conduct and illegal content available online. Our main goal is to develop the safer and healthier use of the internet. We don't want you to, plug the, to pull the plug, instead we want to help you get the most positive experience from using this great uh, technology. Uh, when we talk about digital inclusion and literacy for all, we are talking about creating a more resilient society with new competences, particularly digital ones, which, as we know, are constantly changing and evolving. The development of uh, digital competences is currently, currently one of the major concerns of both developed and developing nations as it represents the foundation of an inclusive digital society. It encompasses important issues for social justice such as accessibility, access, education, digital literacy that comprehends safety and private, uh, privacy issues, rights and ethics and inclusion. Those areas are of fundamental importance to our society and represent a concern that must be addressed in order to achieve the next digital level. The scope of the competences we need for today's digital world is changing. The new practice tends to be based online and usu users, 
uh, normally interact with them through electronic devices. Acquiring these competencies is part of exercising a full citizenship. A country with digitally proficient citizens is also a country where more people are included, involved and able to deal with the society they are part of. We cannot wait to find out what the new technologies will be. We have to be part of their creation. Regarding digital literacy as part of the full exercise of citizenship and inclusion in a society with increasingly more digital practices, where many social interactions happen on the internet and are mediated by electronic devices, Portugal launched an integrated public policy initiative aimed at enhancing digital competencies called ENCODE 2030. Therefore, our national uh, initiative has a broad scope in this uh, drive towards digital development, starting with the promotion of digital inclusion and literacy, educating the young generations from an early age, qualifying the active population and specializing its graduates for advanced digital jobs. The concept of uh, digital competence is understood on a broad manner. It includes the, uh, the notion of digital literacy, meaning the ability to access digital media and ICT, to understand and critically assess contents, and to communicate effectively, as well as the production of new knowledge through research. To, to make sure the whole population has equal access to digital technologies, to obtain information, communicate and interact with others, the program defined uh, five pillars. So uh, one is educa uh, inclusion, uh, the education, qualification, uh, uh, specialization, and the fifth one is research. About action uh, one, <laughs> and is the only one that I will mention. The goal is to ensure that the whole population has the skills, competence and means to use and benefit from digital technologies in order to participate in a networked society. To accomplish this objective, initiatives and digital inclusion programs are being designed and implemented. They have in common the flexibility enough to address different needs and to overcome several obstacles and limitations. Citizens who have already left formal education, unemployed, youth at risk, migra migrants and minorities, the elderly, people with special needs. I would like to stress out that the Portuguese Safer Internet Center contributes to the development and implementation of this line of action and makes every effort to promote digital literacy in an open and inclusive way. Uh, our center is, uh, is concerned with uh, producing a, a, a go, 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 educational and uh, appropriate tools uh, and uh, and we want to create a cooperative spirit among public and private uh, institution and third sector uh, organizations in order to reinforce a positive image and message about the use of uh, online technologies. So two years ago, we launched uh, this uh, web series, Net with Consciousness, that focused on several topics regarding online safety. It covers the story of Joana and João, a Portuguese teenager couple who are regularly visited by their online consciousness, who interacts with them explaining why some things can be riskier than others. The development of the contents and features for this web series and considering its aim of inclusion and accessibility were built to close collaboration with a unit of Foundation for Science and Technology namely the Portuguese sign language and the Portuguese audio description. Last year, and continuing our goal to produce uh, pedagogical resources and contents about safety online able to reach vulnerable people, deaf and blind students, and useful for all, for all we, uh, we developed ZigZag and Annette in partnership with the public online radio. This content is available on an innovative platform that combines old media with internet. It's an online radio program targeting students between the age of five and nine. It aims to be a resource uh, for raising awareness about several online safety content, such as rights and responsibilities online, 
copywriting, disinformation, privacy, digital footprint, print, footprint online, and te technologies addiction, safe online behavior, cyberbullying, among many others. This resource was designed in a universal perspective with the goal of reaching all students. It is about uh, highlighting the importance of developing this work for and with the students and together filling the gap on digital inclusion. Zigzaga is a very well-known TV slot that mainly exhibits cartoons uh, and youngster series from the responsibility of the public Portuguese television. The ZigZag website includes an online radio made for children from uh, five to nine years old, which programming includes multiple pedagogical it items, namely contents from the national basic educational uh, curriculum. I in this context, context PT, uh, the Portuguese Safer Internet Center was invited to develop new contents about online safety. To create the content for the 30 episodes, we had the collaboration of a writer who in a playful and pedagogical way presented us with a story uh, pre uh, represented by a family, friends, where the, the guiding threads uh, is online safety regarding not only the risks they may face, but also the benefits of being online. In the episodes, the characters are escorted by the Awareness Center's mascots that are called to intervene and to collaborate in solving the problems that the characters face or to suggest them tips about online safety. To record the voices of the Radio Online episodes, we engage children and youngsters from different schools. On the other end, this uh, resource was designed in a universal perspective with the goal, with the goal of reach, reaching all students. The reference school for deaf uh, students was challenged to translate the resource into Portuguese sign language. This project was pioneered because the deaf uh, students could be, uh, be included from the beginning and participate in its production. The contents were worked in the classroom by the teachers and students, rehearsed and filmed by the public television. The content is available online and anyone can see it and teachers can use it during awareness sessions. The online series Zigzag and Net was uh, launched in February as, uh, uh, and it was included in the Saver Internet Day celebrations. So I think that this is, uh, uh, this is a, a little bit uh, the experience that we are having uh, uh, in, uh, in Portugal about uh, producing uh, uh, resources that are available for, uh, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sofia and uh, Deborah and Evangelia for very informative um, presentations about the work that the Safer Internet Centers are doing. Um, we have heard a lot about uh, young people's behavior and also resources and support um, they can seek online. As I said before, with the work we're doing on Better Internet for Kids, we're very keen to involve in all our activities uh, children and young people. Um, as you can see here, um, if you go on Better Internet for Kids and you click on Big Youth, you can read more about the activities. And as I said, we have four of our Big Youth ambassadors here with us. So let's turn to the young people and um, let's see if what we heard in the presentation is actually true and this is how it's going on. So we heard in the first presentation about digital footprints. And uh, just from your personal experience, because um, many of you, maybe go back, <laughs> many of you um, are in university and soon are um, applying for jobs. Um, when it comes to your digital footprints, are you guys concerned? Is that something you're thinking about? Or, um, yeah, rather not. Anyone would like to comment? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hi everyone, Jean Pedro speaking. Uh, I don't, I don't think uh, if I'm getting get at the the camera. Uh, the question is very pertinent, and um, I can answer as a personal level, but also with a, uh, a little bit of context about the sessions I've been doing with uh, younger people. Um, when it comes to social media, I think that nowadays young people have a very um, concrete definition of, of, about what they can post and what they cannot post in certain social media. 
the example slide we saw was the um, was Facebook, and uh, we all know nowadays that young people don't use Facebook for sharing the funny stuff; they're using Instagram. And um, another point was mentioned about the the, the concept and the way. Um, we see pictures, and nowadays it's not it's not also it's not only pictures; it's also videos, and that's why they're not using Instagram anymore. They're using TikTok because they provide it with bet better filters, and I think that there that is one of the points that we should reflect on. Um, I mean, technology will evolve, uh, functions. Um, the, the things that we can do with it will improve and I think young people in some sense are aware of that. Uh, on another hand and perhaps more personally, I do believe that what we publish online matters but in time uh, as many people start publishing a lot I don't truly believe that it will impact as much as nowadays uh, we see when we perhaps are trying to get a job because um, it will turn into the current natural to be exposed online. Um, I don't have a personal opinion if that's the, the good way of going or not, but uh, I do believe in some way that it will eventually get less attention. Um, I will just um, add a few things. The question is if um, I'm worried if I go to job interviews what um, they might find um, on my social media or whatever. Um, now I would say even, yes, probably sometimes I should be worried. Was I worried when I posted all this stuff when I was 13 and uh, using Facebook? And no, I wasn't worried at all. <laughs> I frankly didn't care and um, now I just checked my my Facebook wall, I think, two years ago, and um, I was quite embarrassed what um, happened on there, <laughs> and I didn't even remember that all that stuff happened. So um, I think it's pretty clear that we talk about that we have to make children aware of what they're doing, and I think that's totally different on which school you are and what your school is doing on that, because um, I have a cousin who's in a school where they're a lot about doing a lot about media literacy and he's totally aware of what he's doing and he's talking to me about um, what he could do, should do and whatever and then there's the, the godchild of my mom and she's at a school where they don't care and she have, has no real feeling for him, what she could share online and what not. So I think that's a big problem that there's, um, yeah, that there's a big difference between um, schools and school systems. And I wanted to add another thing. I'm just thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, no, I, maybe I, I'll say it later. I will come back, don't worry. Anyone else would like to add something on? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, the other thing is that maybe we also think about that for companies, you search if people are online and you look them up before you want to hire them and it really is strange if you find nothing about them so that's maybe <laughs> le good like the, the other side of the metal so yeah. yeah good point that's rather s looks suspicious and i do have seen job applications for like social media manager or communications officer where it was required that you had a certain number of followers on your twitter and your instagram because they see that you're familiar with the tool that you're active. So this is also the other side. Um, in the second presentation, we heard about digital self and online identity. And here again, for a lot of young people, that's super important. How about you guys? Do you guys have FOMO? Is that something um, you, know, you are concerned about or your peers? Um, well, I personally don't have um, a personal account, like an Instagram account. I have a Facebook, but on, only to communicate with my friends and uh, for projects at the university. Um, but I believe that we should be more aware about the whole concept, and I think it's of great importance, that the topic that we're covering today. Um, so, first of all, I would like to say that uh, we should um, be careful of what we are uploading on our profiles um, and uh, basic, 
I'm sorry, I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, and uh, do you want to say something? Because yeah. I forgot <laughs> everything. Okay, um, I only want to say that I have my personal account on Instagram and I use it to share with my friends what, what I do because I do m many things in social situations. So I use it only to share what I do and not my personal things. For example, when I, mm, I'm with my family or when I'm with my sisters because they are little and I don't want to share their images um, or when I am with my partner because I don't want to share my personal things. So, but, but I think that it is not, mm, there is not knowledge uh, among uh, young people, because I can see on, on Instagram or on Facebook or in Twitter or, or in, in TikTok, right? Um, in, in this moment, in this period, uh, that they can share everything that they do in their life. So, and, and this is not okay because, uh, for example, if I have to answer to the, to the first question, when you have to, to go to work and so you have to, um, to meet your, um, your bosses, for example, they can check your, um, your account and they can see, for example, that you are not a, not, not a good person, but that you share uh, everything that you, do, that you do in your life and it is not okay. It, it can be that you are not a, a major person. Uh, okay, this is, thank you. What I would like to say um, is that uh, when I had an Instagram account, I spent endless hours looking at my feed and what people were posting and that kind of stuff. Um, and then I just decided to terminate my account. And I know that this doesn't apply to everybody, but for me, it was the right course of action. Um, and I think that on Instagram, people are just, um, Instagram just provides a utopian world and people who cannot fit in this utopian world often feel insecure and um, if they don't match with this utopian world they feel so much pressure and um, that's the reason why I think uh, Instagram is just starting uh, to hide um, like counts. I don't know if you heard that. Um, and we should just um, act in social media in the way that it's the right for us which means that um, when we are trying to match with this utopian world, we lose our personality. And some other people, uh, even if it has to do with our job description or not, but generally in the outside world, we lose our personality and people who cannot see exactly what, what we are and what we can do, and we lose everything. So I think that we should be more responsible, and that's why we should become more um, digitally literal in all countries. Um, and uh, that's why I said that the topic that we're covering today is of great importance because this is something that doesn't have to do only with teenagers and children, but also with adults. So it's exactly the same thing for everybody. If I may add something. So um, I've been giving awareness sessions uh, in the Azores Archipelago, um, and uh, it's an interesting thing to ask uh, if young people disconnect before they go to sleep. If they turn off their Wi-Fi or their data before they go to sleep. And the answer, it's not the, it, it wasn't the one I was looking for. And, uh, or I expected at least. Because on different ages, and uh, I covered young people from 12 years old till uh, 16, and it's, it's interesting that it's kind of a community uh, sense of awareness. So in some schools, in some towns, I realized that it was a, a really strong sentiment that they should leave their phones uh, on the living room, uh, especially for the younger teens. And this makes me think if what happened in that community that uh, triggered this best practice. Because on others, um, it was clearly the opposite. Uh, I often played the game with them and uh, asked them where do they leave the, the cell phone at night and why do they do it. Uh, the ones who were turning off the, um, the data and the wireless weren't doing, for instance, because, of the f because they didn't want to uh, be bothered. They were doing, for instance, to save energy. So, 
sometimes their way, the, the way they see technology isn't really the one that they should. And these small details are the ones that we should be focused on in order for like avoiding the FOMO phenomenon. Yeah, I totally saw myself in the pictures you showed. I mean, um, it happens a lot that you, you out with your friends and you um, get some great food and you want to share that because I have no idea why actually I want to share it because it's just like, yeah, see how cool I am and what are you doing? Um, that, and that's basically, it's really stupid, but I mean, we still do it. And um, I was totally shocked, I think, maybe two years ago or something when I checked my screen time on my phone and it was basically 26 hours in the week on my phone. So that's like, that's a day. I spent it like a day on my phone and I was so shocked and me and some friends and we started to um, slowly decrease our screen time with those um, I mean, you can. I think you can set that per day you want to um, social networks to um, close when you reach two hours or three hours or one hour, or whatever you want to decide. And we um, try to cut them down uh, 15 min minutes each month, and um, it totally worked for us because I think if you're on your phone for three hours a day uh, on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, and then you just stop and say it's for one hour, I think that could be quite hard and we try to decrease it slowly and it um, really worked for us to, to do it that way and now I think if you only have like one hour <laughs> per day for your social networks, you are really, um, yeah, you really look for what you're doing with them and not hanging on Instagram for one hour because then you can't use WhatsApp and can't write your friends. So that's um, a thing which worked quite good. And if you're doing it in the group all together with friends and, and family or whatever, then it really works because you have kind of the, the peer pressure. <laughs> So like a first shock therapy and then uh, that's how I think it's really great and I think we should appreciate it how aware these young people are because I think sometimes as adults we, we always try to blame it uh, on the young people, on their behavior and they're not doing it correct but I think this is an amazing best practice example which brings me to one final question before we open up the floor uh, to the audience. What about educating um, our parents, our teachers, our grandparents, uh, because I do see sometimes on Facebook like friends of my parents adding me and they are terrible with what they're posting. They're posting their street address, they are posting exactly where they are at what time of the day and I'm horrified, so what can we do? Um, and I know you guys are doing already um, quite a lot. You, you are exchanging with other peers, uh, but are you also sometimes talking with, with adults about it and how can we make this digital inclusion for all happening, which I think is really important. And maybe I start first. ClickSafe did a really, uh, that's the German Safer Internet Center, did a really great thing when um, I was in school, they built up um, media literacy scouts in school, so the, the students didn't just talk and teach to other students, they also um, had talks and um, get-togethers with the parents, so that was quite cool that basically the students were teaching the, the parents in school, and that was something which uh, worked quite well back at my school. I don't know, five years ago or something. Um, well, I think that we should all be educated. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to do um, if we are adults or not, but everybody should do that. And I also believe that it's part of the government's job um, uh, to just um, to organize that kind of event or to support just all these organizations. Um, and uh, basically, and we, we shouldn't stop until we realize if uh, citizens are responsible users or not. Um, in my country, in Greece, uh, we have also a safer internet center and we post many videos, uh, articles and teaching resources. And we organize an event, and I guess not only my safer internet, but also in the other countries. Um, and schools and adults can come and discuss about internet safety, uh, the impact of influencers and many other topics. And on the same topics are the videos and the articles that are being posting every single week. Um, and we, and 
if we like it or not, we are growing up in the digital age, and it's uh, our responsibility to become uh, more and more digitally literal. Well, answering your question, um, the initiative I mentioned about the Azorian awareness sessions, um, the focus went, was on uh, children online rights, or children rights, and my part was online rights. Uh, and we did uh, thought about the implications about parents and the rest of the community of being involved in enforcing and capacitating those rights. Um, so the, actually, uh, the actual proposal included two sessions, one with young people and other for the community. And to the community, it's really important to stress out that when we talk about digital literacy, it's in fact a, a group of different literacies. And if, for instance, the com computer skills are not all, uh, always or often um, the ones that we need to explain and explore with young people, uh, on the contrary, with the rest of the community, it's something that we need to focus. Because when we speak or when we think about the relationship between young people and the rest of the community, uh, it's all about what we can transfer and what we can share. And perhaps uh, the young people have a, a key role uh, teaching the, other, the rest of the community on how to use technology, uh, but the rest of the community has also at the same time provide uh, with the experience, with the knowledge, perhaps with the advice on the other literacies. Um, for instance, media literacy, information literacy, things that there also need to be worked on as a group. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few uh, minutes left and we would like to open the floor. There was one raising hands earlier um, for some questions or comments. Yeah, hi, hello. My name is Auk Pals. I'm a US ambassador from the Netherlands and I'm also struggling with uh, the screen time on my phone. I'm not on the 30 hours, I'm on the 42 hours last week. Uh, I just checked. Uh, and I'm not even using Instagram and Facebook anymore. Um, now that's with a screen time, we're uh, enabled to um, self-regulate ourselves. However, does that work? Uh, in my case, it doesn't. Um, and with a lot of youngsters trying to get online or um, iPads being brought into classrooms, uh, etc. I'm worried about that because um, they are used to using online tools. And in my uh, experience with um, friends or others, they are scared of um, having, a, not, not really scared, however, they are avoiding real interaction. They are not that developed. Um, in real interaction than um, 20 years ago, I guess. Um, so my, my view on this is that um, there's a split going on. On the one hand, we are trying to get more offline and trying to get that phone away. And on the other hand, there are also companies and governments trying to enable us to get more digital skills. Um, and I'm struggling personally with the, that divide. Um, and I'm curious how you would um, see that split going on and the development. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Maybe I give this to the um, Safer Internet Centers because you are working a lot with either ministries of education but also industry partners. You're going into school. So maybe you can comment on this, on this split that we heard. Yes, um, so uh, I think uh, your question is right uh, into the point. Uh, actually, we are all struggling, not only the youth, but us uh, too, in order to um, decrease the amount of time that we spend online. And that is a fact, because nowadays we have everything online. So I wanted to come here. How would I come here? I didn't know the road. So I used my cell phone in order to the Google map and everything. If I, we are so used to all these um, tools that we have, to all this 
easy way of doing it, so it's normal that we use all of this. Um, but there are implications, like you mentioned. So there, is, there are social implications for children. Children do not learn how to interact physically with another one, with another person. So uh, while they are very digitally uh, advanced, um, and um, considering children uh, like 10 years ago, they are not advanced in social skills, the soft skills that we, uh, we used to call the soft skills. So uh, how do we cope with somebody uh, that is uh, talking like this or talking like that? Because talking is not so often anymore. It's like writing nowadays. So um, how do we um, uh, in, uh, try to translate his face or what he's doing? Is he smiling? Is he not? Is he doing something with his eyebrows? So we don't learn how to uh, translate all the signs that we have when we talk physically to, physically to each other. This is something that researchers have uh, mentioned. They are nowadays trying to figure out uh, what is the middle way, because there is a middle way. We have the technology who is helping us with so many things, who is um, giving us so many opportunities. And on the other hand, we have the social impl implications that we have to take into consideration. This is something that has to be taken like really upper level from the government, from the policies, from the schools. Uh, this is very important. And we are trying to figure it out also in the Safer Internet Centers while we're telling kids uh, you have to be offline, on the other hand, we are online too. And that's a fact. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, can I respond? Yeah, um, so um, your answer is also, okay, we should hire it up, level it up onto a government level. However, I'm also struggling then, how should a government regulate how we uh, spend our time all online. How would you see that? That's not a regulation, what I was mentioning. That is raising awareness about social skills, soft skills in schools. So this is the key to everything. Raising awareness to children, to parents, to educators, that there are these soft skills that children are, uh, need to develop. So um, this is what you do. You bring it to schools. You bring the best practices to schools, and they uh, um, give it uh, to children and to educators. Yeah, so if I may make a, create a kind of discussion. Um, some companies are really good in trying to get our attention, mm -hmm. and um, they, uh, they do have a lot. They got a whole department of that, trying to get our attention. Should that be regulated or be because awareness creating is, I, in my opinion, not enough because it's just a physio physiological process. Um, can we regulate that or? Um, uh, uh, so, um, can, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think you were raising hand. So um, just I will mention something and then I will give floor to the others. Uh, that yes, that, that is something that could regulate it. And when you talk about getting attention of something, actually you're talking about advertisements. Well, that is what I, I understand. Or notifications, that's a, that is... A, private settings, uh, actually. But when we talk about advertisements, then yes, of course, that is something that it should be regulated. Um, and, uh, and they are in the process of, uh, process of regulating it. Like there is a new law for audiovisual audio -visual content, because uh, you also mentioned about videos that are now and, uh, going on, and not only pictures. So they're trying to regulate it um, with um, marking it. So um, this is a new law that is now under discussion in the EU. I think uh, you know too, Sabrina, about audiovisual content. And I don't know if you wanted to add it some to add something, or somebody else wants to add something about this. Uh, I, I just would like to go a little bit uh, 
uh, to the first point that you made. And I think that, uh, at least our experience in Portugal, uh, one of the things uh, that we think it's very, very important is to the um, digital parenting. And we are uh, kind of developing tools uh, and uh, doing uh, sessions to somehow uh, raise a little bit the digital competences of, this, of, of parents in a, a broader uh, way. So that's a point that I think that we have to think and to, to work with them in order to, um, to, to help them to, 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 to go ahead, uh, ahead and communicate with the, the children and to, to, with the youngsters. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that I think we have to be careful about saying, um, I think most of the time we say we have to look out that people are not on their phone all the time, they have to be more offline and stuff, and that's actually not what I really meant with my example. I, my, I For example, I count my screen time on my phone is mostly really um, just social media and net, network stuff. But um, for example, I don't use paper, so I have uh, basically my life is on my tablet and my laptop. And when I'm in university, when I'm everywhere I go, I just I'm on my tablet, laptop, or whatever for like hours, hours, hours a day. So um, probably screen time on that would be I, don't, I have no idea. It probably would explode. So we had recently the example at my university that one professor who's I think 80 or something um, had the idea to turn off the Wi-Fi in his um, in his lecture and he made this proposal and I was like what? The, what? Uh, because I mean I have all my stuff for university is in the next cloud so I basically need internet to work on my stuff and I think that was something he was trying to keep the students away from dabbling and being on Instagram or whatever during his lecture, but with turning off the Wi-Fi, he also yeah, took the chance from me to uh, really work at his lecture. So I think that's the, the real big problem, that it's that online is also for working, and I think that is a good thing. So I think we don't have to be offline on that part, and yeah, that's kind of you know, a weird situation, just to throw that in. Yeah, I think you made a very good point there because I think the, the problem or the mistake we're making is that we're associating screen time with social media interaction, and I think it's a very good point. Um, there was one more question, um, yes, and then we have to wrap up. Ah, okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. My name is Andrei Andrei Sadekow. I originally from Belarus, but here I represent the European Steering Committee for Youth. And my question is, um, uh, how could you describe that uh, growing phenomenon of uh, uh, digital uh, identity for youth or, or digital identification or digital culture for youth? And uh, do you feel a danger uh, growing danger between that digital identity and uh, real world, real physical world, because they are. Uh, this is the lack of, uh, you know, sometimes the lack of connection with these two worlds. I mean, worlds, uh, this uh, digital world and this physical world. Do you feel the uh, the the gap and the danger? Thank you. Okay, um, I think when we do these sessions with young people, it is mostly when you start talking to them about it, they start to identify themselves with what you're, you're telling them. So they do see, for example, this constant need of uh, um, being perfect online, of presenting this online persona. And the thing is that even, for example, we're discussing screen time here. Sometimes I do ask children, for example, how much hours do you spend online? And they can identify, for example, okay, I've spent four hours playing Fortnite, but they wouldn't tell you that they've been Whilst they were playing Fortnite, they were checking from their phone their WhatsApp notifications. They were probably seeing also a YouTube video and doing all the rest of stuff. That doesn't quantify for them as being online, because for them being online was playing the online game with their other online friends. So all this is, when you start discussing all this, children tend to grasp the subject very well. Um, the second question that you mentioned, the reality, what, what, why is it, why it could be a danger? The thing is, the danger 
comes if I am the who I if I am depending on my identity formation, my who I am, on what I am envisaging online, what I'm seeing online. So let's say that's why I brought the example of the Proena website, of the anorexia website. If I am if I have this constant need to appear thin, so I will find groups online which uh, will um, encourage me to eat less, which will encourage me to um, uh, show pictures of myself losing weight. Um, so I'm, not, I'm no longer feeling that I'm the odd one out, but I'm feeling now that I am um, uh, this, my identity, I'm feeling now part of a group as well. So I'm being encouraged, I'm being, um, um, my actions I, are, are being um, in conformity with, with others. That's where the, the risks, uh, where I see that there is a risk. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. And there was one more, one question. Can we take both and perhaps answer? Yeah, or or no? uh, Very quick, I promise. Um, my name is Adrieli. I'm from Brazil and I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a mother of a young boy and he's 10 years old, and something that concerns me is that the screen time that we are talking about, and the use of the screen in the educational process. So I have a strong concern about how it's gonna memorize something that's in the screen, and I would like some, some explanation or if someone hasn't studied about it, and then make a comparison about the rate of uh, good uh, good uh, grades or the comparison with the paper itself and the writing and making them these old skills that we are uh, used to, which is an old skill rather than typing, which is that the pro our brain's not yet used to it. So uh, if someone would like to, I would like so to hear from you about this comparison and how it works. Thank you very much. A research I am aware of, but it is of completely different nature. It's a research on cyberbullying that basically it shows the effects of cyberbullying and it shows that the fact that I can visually see what's been written about me, all the hate speech, all the words about me, I remember it stays longer in my memory and this can affect me longer. So I attach it to what you were saying about kids visualizing content online and I see this also with my kids, that sometimes when you're seeing something online where you're actually visualizing, it stays longer. You, you, you remember it. So, and I think also that kids need this, const there is this constant need to be stimulated to learn because uh, it's very difficult for them to have a lot of concentration reading something, reading an article or writing something. So uh, as we were saying, we're teaching them a lot of digital skills. We're also using interactive whiteboards at school or the tablets, etc. So, and that makes it all interactive. So I think, <laughs> I mean, they are getting some, uh, some education still from, obviously, from digital. Can I ask, ask just one note? About the grade relation or ranking, benchmarking, the difference between the new new uh, approaches and the old approaches, that one uses the, the screen and the others don't, um, I don't really have a number to give you, but I could point you on another direction. Uh, the physiological implications, even the eye strains implications, it's something that you definitely want to pursue on because there's plenty of research on it and it's already uh, clear that the time you spend even on uh, whiteboards during classes, the amount of time that you spend even for the older people working a uh, full day in front of a computer, it has implications. So in that term, uh, if not direct, Directly, perhaps indirectly, it will eventually um, have some uh, impact on the, the grades. I have one short note to that as well. As I already said, I'm just working on tablet and um, my laptop, and I'm, I'm a law student, so I mean, you probably can imagine how 
lot of stuff I have to learn and how many hours I sit on that. And I think for me, it kind of took me six months or something to get used to writing on my tablet and just tipping my definitions and all that stuff. And, but then it worked exactly as good as uh, before and um, compared to the, the, my, like my peers and the other ones who are starting with me, they're not better by writing that down with their hand and on paper. So uh, that's just uh, from my experience and what you just mentioned. Yeah, I, I think I try to do that like um, for one hour, I sit on my tablet, I try to close my eyes or, uh, or walk around for five minutes and then it really helps. So I think that's really something which we should establish in school if they are walking, working on tablets and stuff, uh, the more, yeah. Thank you very much. And there was one final question. Or a comment, yeah? Yeah. I don't know, yeah. Um, I'm just jumping in because I think the topic is so interesting. Um, also coming from you talking about screen time and all um, stuff considered yeah, with this. I think um, my personal opinion is the problem we have collectively is something that is more uh, important individually. So. I'm not against technology or or everything that comes with it. It, it would be stupid. We cannot like stop time and stop progress. Um, but what I see is that we learn, like we are getting more and more depending on devices and apps, that we lose the connection to ourselves. And we need a screen time to be reminded that I, I have been on my phone all day and I need a reminder about how I feel, what I have to do. And I think um, it's great. It, it helps us in many ways. But I think we need an education that um, brings, us, brings us back to ourselves, that I don't need a reminder to ask myself how I am and how I feel and if I'm good and if I work too much or if I need time for myself, so that we don't forget the relation to ourselves. So coming to identity and all this stuff at a young age, I think it's really important to teach the kids that all of this is an opportunity, but we, sh we should stop like the internet took power over us and we need to take this power back. Like it's a great opportunity for, for having um, a very dynamic and uh, modern life. But I think we have to make the balance and we lo lost this balance because ne technology was so much, so much faster than us. And yeah, that it was just my comment. That were very fantastic closing words. I think we yeah. couldn't uh, <laughs> phrase it better. And I'm really glad that we had this discussion um, this evening here. Um, we have to close now, but it's just day zero of IGF. So there's more going on. Please come and visit us in the InSafe booth. And we would be happy to, con to continue this conversation um, with you. And then also for all of those who are interested in the topic of online hate speech, there will be a workshop hosted by us and uh, the German Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection on Thursday at 9.30, actually, not 9 o'clock, as I said here. And please uh, stay up to date on betterinternetforkids.eu. You will learn more about the great work of the Safer Internet Centers. You will find resources, and um, you will also learn more about the topic of positive content online, because as we all agreed, it's very important that from a very young age children are introduced to good and high quality content and I think the moderation between being online and offline is quite important. Thank you very much for joining and have a nice evening. <laughs>